Hi, my name is Daniel Kitts. I'm the online editor uh, with the agenda with Steve Pagan, and we're here. Um, I'm actually going to start again because I think it's delayed, um, and I'll edit that this part. Hi, my name is Daniel Kitts. I'm an agenda. <laughs> Every time that this happens, not so easy, is it? No, no. <laughs> Hi, my name is Daniel Kitts, and I'm the online editor with the agenda with Steve Bacon, and we're here today to talk to Steve Bacon about his top stories of 2013. Thanks for taking the time, Steve. Delighted. So you picked several stories from sort of different uh, areas of the news as your top 2013 stories. So I think your first one is a local story. What's your top local story? I've tried to sort of divide it into basically five areas. You know, a big, big local story for Ontario's capital city, a big provincial story, a big national story, a big international story. And then a fifth thing being, I guess, a big business slash economy story. Okay. So, start with starting with the local situation in Ontario's capital city. I think everybody would agree there's only been one story this year, and that is the the fiasco around what is uh, the mayoralty in the city of Toronto. Uh, I would say some people would say since 2010, but certainly uh, this year. Uh, I've been covering politics 30 years. I can never remember anything like this happening in any municipality anywhere in Canada, uh, certainly in the United States, it, it, um, it has happened before. You have the Marion Berries of Washington, D.C., that kind of thing. But in Canada, I think uh, Rob Ford has set a new standard for a very different kind of mayoralty. Let's just put it that way. Fair enough. Well, you're, uh, let's move on to provincial politics. What's your top story there? Uh, again, an historic year for very different reasons, obviously. Um, Ontario, for the first time in nearly 150 years, got its first female premier this year. Uh, Kathleen Wynne won the leadership at Maple Leaf Gardens back in January of 2013. She got sworn in as premier in February, uh, swore in her new cabinet, and of course has tried to, in the intervening months, uh, put in the rearview mirror the things that Dalton McGinty left her that were extremely problematic, and tried to put her own stamp on the government. Uh, one of the things I frequently get asked is, when is when is Kathleen Wynne going to become a legitimate premier? Mm. Uh, meaning that somehow she's illegitimate right now because she has not gone to the people to seek, quote unquote, her own mandate. And I think it's just worth noting at this moment that there's actually nothing in our British parliamentary tradition and history that requires somebody assuming the premiership to go out and get his or her own new mandate before they're considered legitimate. We don't elect premiers, we don't elect prime ministers, we elect parliaments. And then it's up to the leader of whatever party has the most seats in parliament to determine who gets to govern or who gets the first chance at governing. And the reality is we elected a provincial parliament in 2011 and that parliament's life, according to law, goes until October 2015. So technically, legally, conventionally, actually, Kathleen Wynne can be the legitimate Premier of Ontario until October 2015, when by law she has to go visit the Lieutenant Governor, have the Parliament dissolved, and then go out and seek her own mandate at that point. But there's nothing illegitimate about her Premiership at this point. Um, having said that, you know all the rumors. We may be off to an election in the spring. Possibly. One quick follow-up. I, I have heard people on our website actually sort of get involved in this sort of is she legitimate, she's not legitimate. And one person made the point that I get that technically she's a legitimate premier, but in this day and age, we expect um, you know the leaders of our governments to go before the people to to get their mandate. So, how do you respond to that idea that even though technically she's a legitimate premier, really until she gets her own mandate, there's something uh, lacking about her legitimacy in the eyes of the people? Uh, I I can't respond on behalf of all of the people, whether all of the people or some of the people or which percentage of Fair the enough. people don't yeah. consider her legitimate or which percentage do. I'm going by the rules. This mm -hmm. is our tradition for a century and a half. Uh, this is the way it works. Um, I guess I should turn the blackberry on at some point. Uh, but that's the way it works. And the fact is, there are numerous examples throughout our history. John Turner, uh, I think, waited a, less than a week after he became Prime Minister in 1984, before going to visit the Governor General and kicking off an election, which didn't go his way, and he ended up being Prime Minister for the second shortest space of time in Canadian history. Uh, conversely, um, Ernie Eves got elected uh, the leader of the Conservative Party in 
2002? 2002, yes, early 2002, and didn't go to the people uh, for a year and a half, till uh, a little more than a year and a half, till October of 2003. So there's, you know, and I guess I, I hear mostly, I guess, from conservatives who say that Kathleen Wynne is not legitimate. Um, and I've been hearing from those conservatives for about a year and a half that she's not, or I guess technically for a little less than a year, that she's not legitimate. But I think you have to be consistent about this. If it was legitimate for Ernie Eves to be premier for 17 months or 18 months before calling an election, then I guess it's equally as legitimate that Kathleen Wynne, after 11 months in power, uh, hasn't called an election yet either. I think you have to be consistent on these things. Fair enough. Well, let's move on to the federal scene. What's your federal story of the year? Well, the big story, of course, was the Senate this year, federally. And uh, again, uh, following politics for three decades in this country, and I can never remember. First of all, when did anybody ever talk about the Senate? That's number one. Very, very rarely. Uh, but number two, uh, we know a lot more about the Senate now than we ever did, and not necessarily for the right reasons. One of the things that I think as really astonishes me Daniel, is that, you know, again, by the laws, by the traditions, by the conventions of our country, the Senate governs itself. The Senate is supposed to be beyond the grasp of the Prime Minister. The Senate does not answer to the Prime Minister or the government of the day. And yet, for some reason, this Prime Minister's office has been deeply involved in trying to fix its Mike Duffy problem, its Pamela Wallen problem, etc., and never mind that legally speaking they ought not to have been involved in it, but politically, strategically speaking, uh, I'm confused as to why this Prime Minister and this PMO felt the need to get involved in that. Uh, it was clearly a political mistake to get involved because the Prime Minister now has to wear all of what has transpired. These two senators were his appointments. so. He's not only on the hook because of those appointments, but he's made himself even more on the hook um, by deciding to get involved and have his former chief of staff, or whether the circumstances under which his former chief of staff decided to try to solve these problems uh, remains somewhat murky. But this, to me, is one of the great questions as we look at national politics in 2013. All right. Well, you've taken us from local to provincial to federal, so the next step is international. What's the international story? Once again, I, I, I think no question about this. I think the death of Nelson Mandela over time will prove to be the biggest story internationally in 2013 uh, for all of the reasons that we have discussed on our program all over the world. Um, this is a man the likes of which comes around once every 25 years, once every 50 years. And he was an extraordinary man. And the fact that he had, maybe you'll correct me on this, I'm not sure, but did he have the biggest funeral in the history of the world? I mean, he had more world leaders, I think, go to his funeral than anything I can ever remember. Um, Lady Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, right up there with those two, Pope John Paul II. Um, and he was, in a, he, he was, by the end of things, I know the coverage was quite positive, um, as it appropriately should have been. He had his faults, obviously. He didn't do everything perfectly. But he was about as unambiguously heroic a character as you see in international affairs today as anybody I can ever think of. Well, but certainly, I think, yeah, people are definitely remember uh, his life and, and uh, that funeral. You're right. I don't know if it is the biggest ever. I don't know if they've ever measured that, but it, it probably would be right up there. If you measure it by the number of world leaders who mm -hmm. came to it, can't think of a bigger it's one. It's hard to think of that. Uh, all right. Well, uh, from local to international, uh, everything that in every place, one thing makes the world go around, and that's money. So your economic story for the year? I'm being a bit parochial on this one, and that is um, I want to look at Canada. And the two biggest Canadian business stories, I think, of the year, one positive, one negative. The positive one is that the new governor of the Bank of England is a Canadian. And I think that's a pretty impressive thing. Mark Carney, of course, left Canada, has gone over there. And the notion that the Bank of England, which I guess has only been around for about six or seven hundred years, would come to Canada to find its next governor uh, speaks extremely well of Mark Carney, obviously, and then well of the country as well. Uh, sadly, on the downside, I suspect the one truly international Canadian brand that exists 
that's and I still use one, is the BlackBerry. And this has been a terrible year for BlackBerry. And uh, obviously, we will watch with interest to see if uh, their new CEO can turn things around. But at the moment, uh, this once wonderfully iconic, wonderfully successful Canadian story uh, isn't right now. And it's, it's a shame. Yeah. But I'm still loyal. You, you, you are. You definitely are. Well, um, thanks for taking the time, Steve. Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. You haven't oh, asked about... Oh, I forgot. You, there's one... There's the biggest story. He, he said the biggest story for last. You have not asked me about the best story of yes. 2000. And the biggest story <laughs> and the best story of this year was that the Red Sox won the World Series. The third time in ten years. And I know that's completely trivial and not important for most people, most thinking people in this country. I know it means a lot to you. It did mean a lot to me, and it was very sweet. And it was it was very sweet in part because I've been a Red Sox fan for almost 40 years. Uh, but in part because, and this is really the bigger story around it, uh, baseball is one of those wonderful games, unlike hockey, unlike basketball, where when you go to these games, they're so... It's like you're going to a rock concert. It's just a constant assault on your sensibilities as they pump the music in and... The, the scoreboard yells, tells people to cheer louder and make noise. Baseball's not like that. Baseball, you go, it's a slow game, it's an intricate game, it's a great game for chess players and statisticians and that kind of thing, and you can have a conversation with somebody. And the nice part about seeing the Red Sox win the World Series this year was that my oldest son and I went to one of the games in Boston in the American League Championship Series. And we went to one of the games in the World Series as well, where I got that little souvenir cup. And we went to Game 4 of the World Series. And in both of those games, we were lucky enough to see... This is a big Sox fan, too. We were lucky enough to see something that had never happened before. And that was uh, a Grand Slam home run in a, in a Championship Series game, which we saw in Boston. And then a World Series game and on a pickoff move, when Koji Uehara threw over to first base and picked off uh, Carmen Wong and uh, Carlos Beltran sat there at home plate with the bat on his shoulders, astonished that a game was going to end that way, and he wouldn't have a chance to bat in the winning run for St. Louis. So that's why it was, it was partly wonderful because I love the Sox, and it was partly wonderful because when you share those kinds of moments with your kids, your parents, or with friends, uh, they're unforgettable. Yeah, you actually wrote a very nice blog post about baseball and family uh, right around when the Sox uh, won. Um, there's my BlackBerry. There's your BlackBerry. Yeah. If, if Hamilton had won the Grey Cup, I don't know what what you would have done. I would have been insufferable. <laughs> that would have been too much to hope for. So when they lost the Grey Cup, which I knew they would lose, yeah. did I talk to you the day before the Grey Cup when I said they'd lose by 21 points? I think you told me at some point that you had made that prediction. I can't yeah. remember when. Yeah. I said the day before the game they'd lose by 21. I think they lost by 22, so I was pretty close. Pretty close. Um, great for them to make it that far, though. Great for them to make it that far, and... And really, that would have been just, that's more joy than any one person should be allowed to experience in one year, having their favorite baseball team and football team win the championship in the same year. And then if the Leafs won the stint, well, no, never mind. Well, we'll see. They're, there's definitely a lot better than they have been past few years, so you never know. Anyway, thanks a lot, Steve, uh, and uh, looking forward to doing uh, covering 2014 with you. And let me just say Merry Christmas to you and yours. Can I tell people your news? Is that all right? Yeah, sure, you can. Yeah. Okay, because it's personal. But uh, Daniel and his wife are expecting a baby, so I think 2014 is going to be a fabulous year for you and um, and for your fabulous wife. And uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year and best of the season to everybody watching this right now. Fair enough. Take care, everybody.